Welcome to Cinematic Excrement. Last time, we looked at the serious lapse in judgment that was Morbius. But our good friends at Sony were not done there. They were determined to plunge ahead with yet another Spider-Man movie without Spider-Man. I would say with predictable results, but honestly, while I'm sure many predicted it would be bad, I don't think anyone understood just how bad it would be. Good people of Earth, let us look at Madam Web. Released in February of 2024, Madam Web was directed by S.J. Clarkson in her big screen directorial debut, although she already had plenty of television credits under her belt, including Dexter, Orange is the New Black, Jessica Jones, and many more. Dakota Johnson stars as Cassandra Webb, and the movie follows her journey to becoming the titular Madam Webb. Spoiler alert, it's a rough journey. A rough and stupid journey. The movie ended up with five credited writers between the story and the screenplay, and according to Johnson, the script underwent drastic changes to the point where the movie they ended up making was not the movie she signed up for. Rumor has it the original plan was for a Terminator-style plot, where the villain Ezekiel Sims, played by Tahar Rahim, goes back in time to try to kill young Peter Parker before he can become Spider-Man, and Madam Web and her Spider-Women have to stop him. That actually sounds interesting on paper. Pity it's not what we actually got. Johnson also mentioned in an interview that the movie was essentially made by committee, with far too many studio executives getting their grubby little hands on the project. Art does not do well when it's made by committee. So let's take a look at just how this committee managed to screw the pooch. Our story begins in 1973, where we see a very pregnant Constance Webb, Cassie's mother, researching rare spiders in the Amazon. I don't know who let that woman travel in her condition, but they should be strung up. She finds a rare spider she had been looking for, for reasons that are not yet known to us, but her hired security, Ezekiel Sims, suddenly straight up murders her and takes the spider for himself. Members of an indigenous tribe known as Las Aranas, literally the spiders, suddenly appear out of nowhere wearing very silly costumes and using even sillier special effects to move around. They attempt to use some special spider venom to save Constance's life, and it fails. But they do save her daughter, so it wasn't a total loss. Then we move to the present day, and this is where things start to go off the rails, both in front of and behind the camera. One of the events we see in this movie is the birth of Peter Parker. Reportedly, the original plan was to set most of the movie in the early 1990s, allowing the timeline to match up with the Andrew Garfield version of the character. But at some point, plans changed and the setting was moved to 2003, with baby Peter now being the Tom Holland version of Spider-Man. This all ended up being pointless as any mention of Spider-Man was ultimately removed from the movie. In fact, even though we see his birth, Peter is never mentioned by name. I'm not kidding. The movie even goes out of its way to point out how determined they are to not mention his name. Check this out. So because Cassie got some of that special spider venom in the womb, she eventually starts getting some strange powers. She does not gain the ability to climb walls like a certain friendly neighborhood superhero the movie is determined not to mention, which she demonstrates in what is actually a pretty funny scene. But she does experience a bit of deja vu now and then, seemingly jumping forward and backward in time and reliving the previous few minutes. This happens during Mary Parker's baby shower, where they play a game of Guess the Baby's Name. Well, doesn't that sound like fun? A bunch of people randomly shouting out names that are all but guaranteed to be wrong. Who came up with this idea? And how much alcohol was involved? After several failed guesses and a balloon randomly popping... <laughs> It sounds like Mary is about to finally just tell them when suddenly... The name is... <laughs> what in the deja fuck was that? This is so bizarre. Why would they put so much effort into not telling us the baby's name and act so goddamn weird about it? And this isn't the only time this bullshit happens. Earlier in the movie, Cassie, who works as an EMT, is having lunch with her partner, Ben Parker. Yes, the future Uncle Ben played by Adam Scott. Ben mentions he's dating someone, and naturally, Cassie asks her name. And Ben... clams up for no discernible reason. Um... serious. Yeah, I guess it must be ser- wait. What does that even mean? I assume the girlfriend in question is the future Aunt May, though I don't understand why Ben wouldn't want to tell Cassie her name. What does he think is going to happen if he does? 
Has something happened before? Is there a history we should be aware of? Because if so, it'd be nice if the movie made us aware of it. She's a lucky lady, Ben. Well, you say that now, but give it about 16 years. Anyway, the first time we see Cassie and Ben, they're transporting a patient to a hospital and doing their damnedest to make sure she doesn't survive. Seriously, real ambulance drivers do not drive this recklessly, because, duh, of course they don't. In fact, they almost run down this young skateboarder, though it was mostly her fault for playing in traffic. And she responds by flipping Cassie off. Who flips off an ambulance? This skateboarding hooligan is Maddie Franklin, played by Celeste O'Connor. We'll come back to her later, but for now, we fast forward to the hospital. She's gonna be okay. Who? Your, uh, patient. You know, the one you just brought in? You were there! If that wasn't dumb enough, the patient's son tries to give them a drawing he made for them, and they act super awkward about it because... I don't even know. You know what? Mr. Ben Parker here did all the work, so... Will one of you just take the drawing? Take it. Just take it. <laughs> Why are you being so weird about this? Just smile and take the kid's crappy drawing. It's not a big deal! What am I supposed to do with this? Oh my god, take it home, stick it on the fridge, throw it away, shove it up your ass. It doesn't matter. Why are you like this? Have you never encountered a child before? I have known Cassie for about five minutes, and I already want her to die. I suppose I technically get my wish, but I'm getting ahead of myself. And Ben isn't much better, which is what really grinds my gears. This movie does the unthinkable and the unforgivable. It made me hate Uncle Ben, but the asshole train hasn't left the station yet. The nurse invites the family to see the patient, but Dad says this girl should stay behind because she's only the stepdaughter and therefore not important enough to see Mom, I guess. Good lord, how many assholes do we have in this movie? Yo! This poor girl is Julia Cornwall, played by Sydney Sweeney. We will come back to her later, but for now we go to Cassie's apartment, where we later learn she leaves her junk mail in the lobby, and everyone else has to clean it up for her. And I'll bet that recycling bin is like five feet away from where she dumps it, because she's that bitch. We also see a girl getting a talking to from the landlord because her dad is behind on the rent. This is Anya Corazon, played by Isabella Merced. We'll come back to her right now, because she and the other girls are being hunted by our villain, Ezekiel Sims, who hasn't aged a day even though it's been 30 years. This is one of the problems with the hasty rewrite of the timeline. Tahar Rahim is my age, and had they stuck with the original plan of setting the movie in the 90s, that would probably put the character in his 40s. That works, but they jumped ahead to 2003, meaning he should be in his 50s by now. I am not buying for one second that that dude is 50. People tell me I look good for my age, but I don't look that good. Sims has been having nightmares about the future where three masked superheroes infiltrate his home and kill him, and they sure do look familiar, don't they? Maddie, Julia, and Anya are indeed the future Spider-Women. And I hope you enjoyed that brief vision of them in their spider suits kicking the villain's ass, because Sims' nightmare is about the only time we see that kind of thing. I wish I was kidding. This is a sign of what could have been. We could have had Madam Web and her Spider-Women taking names and kicking ass. Instead, we get Cassie the sociopath and three punk-ass girls. I understand they wanted to do something different, and sometimes different is good. Other times, like this, it's a mistake. Getting back to Mr. Sims, he poisons an NSA employee and offers her the antidote if she gives up her NSA login, which she does. And then he just lets her die anyway. Oh great, another asshole. Although he is the villain, so I guess he's supposed to be an asshole. He and his assistant, whose name I can't be bothered to remember, log into the NSA surveillance system, and this sequence is bonkers. And not just because the ADR is laughably bad. I came from nothing less than nothing. I will not give up everything I've built and have my life cut short. And it's not just this scene. All of his dialogue is ADR'd, and it's painfully obvious. If I didn't know better, I'd swear he was doing it badly on purpose but also because the people who came up with this movie's version of NSA surveillance do not understand how technology works. Sims is able to digitally recreate the images of the spider women he saw in his dream with pixel-perfect accuracy. How? And then the computer can de-age and demask them, identify them by name, and instantly ping them whenever they pass in front of any camera in New York City. That kind of technology didn't exist in 2003. I'm pretty sure it doesn't exist now. And somehow this NSA technology can do all of this 
but it cannot detect when someone is accessing their system using a dead woman's login from an unrecognized IP address. Right. By the way, Sim says several times in this movie that he came from nothing and will not let the spider women take away what he's built. But I have no idea what that actually is. What has he done? How did he do it? Why did the spider women attack him in the future? And why should I care? These are the questions the movie never even attempts to answer. Maybe the answers were in the original script before all the rewrites, but they're gone now. It also doesn't answer why Sims likes to walk around barefoot. I know that's what the character did in the comics, but I shouldn't have to read the comics to understand the movie. Though I have a sneaky suspicion it wouldn't help. I know Sims has similar powers to Spider-Man, and initially I assumed he needed to be barefoot to walk on walls. But his Spidey suit includes footwear, and he can climb the walls just fine with that, so what the hell is his deal? Moving right along, after a near-death experience, Cassie suddenly finds she has special powers and can see brief glimpses of the future but she can't do it on command. The visions come and go whenever it's convenient for the plot, and one such moment occurs when she just happens to find herself on a train with the aforementioned spider brats. After seeing a vision of Sims murdering them, she convinces them they're in danger and leads them off the train while Sims straight up murders several cops. This leads the police to start searching for... Cassie. Because they think she kidnapped the girls. I know the NYPD doesn't exactly have the best reputation nowadays, and not without reason, but this is pushing it. There is no way they're going to ignore the dude in the creepy costume that just murdered several cops and say, you know what we need to do? Chase down that 120 pound woman. She's the real threat. Of course, Cassie doesn't do herself any favors by stealing a taxi cab, but don't worry, she ensures the cops won't be able to track her down by removing the license plate, because the typical New York City cab doesn't have any other identifying markings they can track. You know, Sims, I have no idea what your deal is, but please just kill them all. They deserve it. Case in point, Cassie takes the girls to hide out in the woods and leaves them alone for an hour or two. They then decide the best course of action when they're trying to hide from a homicidal maniac is to go to a nearby diner and start dancing on the table. Sure enough, they're discovered and nearly killed by Sims, but Cassie saves the day by running his ass over. Considering how terrible an ambulance driver she is, I'm betting it's not the first time she's done that. She almost ran over Maddie earlier. Speaking of Maddie, in case you're wondering if the girls' families are worried about their daughters being kidnapped by a crazy lady with a stolen taxi, some exposition lets us know that's off the table. Maddie's rich parents are out of the country and barely acknowledge her existence, Julia's family wants nothing to do with her, as we saw in the hospital, and Anya's parents were undocumented and deported, a fact she's desperately trying to hide until she turns 18. The movie tries to play it off as if they all have something in common because they're all orphans. But... Except for Cassie, they're not. Their parents are alive, they're just absent. That's not what orphan means. But I am at least feeling a bit more sympathy for two out of the three. Maddie is rich and was playing in traffic and flipped off an ambulance, so I'm not sold on her just yet. At this point, Cassie gets somewhat smarter and leaves the girls with Ben instead of just dumping them in the woods. She also teaches them CPR for some reason. Gee, I wonder if that will come into play later. After reviewing her mother's notebook, Cassie finds a photo of her mother and... <gasps> Ezekiel Sims! But I'm not sure who possibly could have taken this photo. It wasn't taken with Cassie's camera. She's holding it in the picture. Who was the photographer? That's clearly just a still from an outtake from the cold open. And trying to pass that off as a candid photograph is just lazy. Cassie then manages to travel back to Peru and later returns to the United States and is apparently never stopped by security or customs or anything. Isn't she still wanted by the police? Or did the movie just forget about that? While in Peru, she finds one of Las Arañas who apparently does know how to dress like a normal person. Either that or they didn't bring his spider costume for the reshoots. This dude, who has apparently been waiting around for Cassie for the last 30 years, informs her that her mother came to darkest Peru because Cassie had a condition called myasthenia gravis, which is a real neuromuscular disorder for which there is no cure. Constance was trying to find a rare spider that supposedly had healing properties, hoping it could cure her baby's condition. Now I'm no doctor, nor do I play one on TV, so I have no idea if it's even possible to detect such a disease in the womb in 2024, let alone in 1973. 
But according to this article from Johns Hopkins, while myasthenia gravis typically affects adult women, it is possible for a woman to pass the disease onto her child in the womb. And, uh, oh, hold the phone. The infant form of the disease is temporary and usually clears up in two to three months. Oh, you've got to be yanking my chain. Oh, oh boy. So to recap. Constance Webb, while very pregnant and in no condition to travel, risked her own life and her unborn child's to travel to the Amazon in search of some mythical cure for Cassie's condition, which would have cleared up on its own within a few weeks of her being born. Everyone in this movie is a waste of oxygen. Moving on, after showing her the truth about her mother, La Aranya, I'm sure he has a name, but I don't care, tells Cassie that her powers will not just allow her to see the future, but to be in more than one place at one time. That sounds tiring. And when you take on the responsibility, great power will come. Wait, but... No! No, 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 no! That's not the line! This is the line! With great power comes great responsibility. You've got a completely bass backwards. What is going on here? The entire point of Ben saying that line was for Peter to understand that he has to use his power responsibly. It doesn't mean taking on responsibility magically gives you superpowers. That's just stupid. Also, Senor Aranya, where the hell do you get off lecturing anyone about responsibility? Did you take responsibility for Cassie when her mother died? No, you shipped her back to New York and dumped her in the foster system. Where do you get off? Also, how did you get her into the New York foster system? Can you just bring any baby into New York from outside the country and say, here, you take her? Because I'm pretty sure it's not that simple. So after that spiritual journey, or whatever the f*** that was, Cassie returns to New York and continues driving around in a stolen taxi, which does not lead to any trouble. Keep in mind, she is still wanted by the police. Around the same time, Mary suddenly goes into labor and Ben has to drive her to the hospital. For reasons I cannot explain, he takes the girls along for the ride. Why? They're supposed to be in hiding! Do you not understand how hiding works? And of course, Sim's assistant immediately finds them once they pass by a security camera. I've intercepted a call to the hospital. Wait. How do you know the call you intercepted has anything to do with them? There are 8 million people in New York. They get thousands of 911 calls every day. There's no way you could have made that connection, at least not that quickly. I get the feeling the people who made this movie do not understand the difference between technology and magic. Because she's not already in enough legal hot water, Cassie steals an ambulance and runs Sims over. Again. If he had a nickel for every time Cassie crashed an automobile into his ass, he'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. While Ben and Mary flee for their lives, Cassie and the girls run into a fireworks factory and start setting them off, hoping they'll take out Sims. Her visions are conveniently much more precise now, which allows her to avoid getting killed. But Sims still pursues them to the roof and uppercuts a firework into a f***ing helicopter. Okay, that was kind of awesome. Although I'm wondering how Cassie did not see that one coming. You just got those people killed, Madam Webb. Great job. They also kind of rip off a scene from the first Spider-Man movie when all three Spider-Brats suddenly find themselves hanging onto the rafters for dear life, and Cassie has to make a choice. You can't save all three! I'm not sure why you're taking the time to point that out, but thanks. But Cassie's multi-locating powers kick in, and she is, in fact, able to save all three of them. And Sims just stands there and watches it happen. You were trying to kill them all, right? That is still the plan? Did I miss something? Anyway, I should point out this building has a huge neon Pepsi sign. This is actually important as throughout the movie, Cassie keeps getting visions of the S in Pepsi falling. And while she's on the roof, 
they keep focusing on the S. Boy, is that S ever important. Something is going to happen with that S. So what happens to Ezekiel Sims? He gets crushed by the P. Not the S, the P. Okay, I'm convinced the movie is just messing with us at this point. Like, this has to be an elaborate prank. It's the only thing that makes sense. Cassie falls into the river and drowns, which means I technically got my wish and she died. Yay! But the girls use their CPR training to save her life. Well, at least that paid off. She did take a firework to the face, blinding her, and she also seems to be paralyzed from the waist down, but I'm not entirely sure how that happened. Fortunately, I don't care. Cassie officially adopts the three little shits, and thank God the movie's over. Unlike a lot of superhero movies, this does not have a post credit scene, but I'm actually not mad about that. This movie was terrible, and there was no reason to make it any longer. I'd really like to know how the screenwriting duo of Matt Sazama and Burke Sharpless keep finding work, because they do not exactly have the best track record. Dracula Untold, The Last Witch Hunter, Gods of Egypt, and yes, Morbius. And as bad as Morbius was, this was somehow worse. The story is an incoherent mess, almost all of the characters are horrible people, the writers have no idea how surveillance technology works, they have no idea how foreshadowing works, the villain's backstory is non-existent, the visual effects are crap. In a way, it's actually fitting that the movie is set in 2003, because the CGI looks like it's from 2003. And I still can't get over how they avoided mentioning Peter's and May's names in the most awkward way possible. And yet, they were somehow able to name drop J. Jonah Jameson. There's a moment where Maddie briefly mentions her Uncle Jonah, and in the comics, she is indeed Jameson's niece. So once again, we have an opportunity to work Jameson into the movie, and it doesn't happen. Sony, Marvel, I would like to restate my request from the previous review. Give us the Multiverse Council of Jamesons. You know you want to. The three future Spider-Women are pretty much the only bright spots here, and I would very much like to know why we couldn't have just had a movie with Madam Web and the Spider-Women saving New York City from whatever supervillain is trying to burn it down this time. This origin story did not need to be told, at least not in this format. You're all familiar with the saying, this meeting could have been an email? Well, this movie could have been a flashback. Give me the condensed version of how Cassie, Maddie, Julia, and Anya came together and then have them do some superheroing. It's been done before, it works. Again, I understand they wanted to do something different, but they still needed to do it well and they very much did not. The movie made about $100 million at the box office, which means it more or less broke even with its production budget. But that would not include marketing costs, meaning Madam Web was a certified box office bomb. It was savaged by critics, the general public, and the cast. Dakota Johnson herself stated she was not surprised by the movie's reception. I don't think anyone who saw the trailer was surprised either. That trailer was a masterclass in how not to market a movie. But to be fair... I don't know if there was necessarily a way to make a good trailer for Madam Web. The movie didn't exactly give the marketing department a lot to work with. It is a truly baffling cinematic experience, and I lost track of how many times I asked myself, what the hell were they thinking? But there were also a few moments where I couldn't help but laugh at the incompetence on display. Honestly, the more I watched it, the more I enjoyed it in a weird way. It might be worth a watch on streaming if you're in the mood to riff on a bad movie, and I would like to see Rift Tracks take a crack at this one. But most of you should probably give this one a pass. Stick to the Spider-Man movies that actually have Spider-Man in them. Maybe Venom The Last Dance and Kraven will show that Sony has learned from their mistakes, but I'm not holding my breath. Next time, we're going to return to a horror franchise that I covered a long time ago. So prepare for something spooky. And stupid. Mostly stupid. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Sony really needs to get their act together. Great ability comes great accountability. That's not even how the saying goes, Man, Dad.